Hi everybody and welcome to the first part of the Generative Music AI course. This part is called Foundations and it's addressed to both our student profiles, that is technologists on the one hand and musicians. Let's take a look at the different topics that we'll be covering during this part. I'm going to dedicate one video for each topic. Let's quickly go through them. We'll start with some context on generative music, then we'll take a look at a brief history of generative music, just mentioning the main, most important um, systems that have been published throughout time, over the last 50 plus years. Then we'll take a look at generative music use cases, the ethical implications of generative music, Afterwards, we'll take a look at some more technical stuff, but from a high level perspective so that musicians can follow along. First, we'll take a look at the difference between symbolic and audio generation. And then we'll dive into different generative music techniques that we use to compose music with computers. And finally, we'll take a look at the current limitations of generative music systems and take a look at how we could address them looking for different approaches in the future. Okay, without any further ado, let's get into the first video of foundations. So in this video, I'm going to address the question, what's generative music? So that I'll give you a little bit of a, an overview so that you'll have some context about generative music. In particular, I'm going to address this four points. First of all, I'm going to give you the difference between intelligent and creative tasks. Then I'm gonna give you my personal definition of generative music. Then we'll dive into all the different disciplines that make up generative music or that contribute to generative music. And finally, we'll take a look at some, at a few of the challenges that we still have in generative music. Okay, let's start from the difference between intelligent and creative task. And we'll start with this picture. The ones of you who are familiar with computer vision will probably recognize the task, the intelligent task that uh, I'm portraying here with this picture. And that is object detection. So the task is quite straightforward. I have a picture and I want to local locate and identify all the different objects and name them within picture. Like for example, here I have people and statues. So this is an example of an intelligent task. So we have a machine that tries to do something that's intelligent. We'll see what that actually means in a second. But before we get there, let me give you another example of an intelligent task. And that happens every time you talk to Siri and hope that Siri will understand what you say. This task is called speech recognition. So there are many characteristics that make a task intelligent, but I want to highlight a couple because they are very important to understand the difference between working with intelligent tasks and working with creative tasks. The first characteristic that I want to mention of an intelligent task is the ability to create an objective success metric that we can use to evaluate the quality of an algorithm that undertakes a particular intelligent task. So let's take as an example the case of speech recognition. So I can craft a success metric that um, gives me the percentage of correctly transcribed words against those that haven't been correctly transcribed. In the case of object detection, I could do something similar as well. So I have a sort of ground truth and then I'm going to look at the number of objects in a picture or in multiple pictures that have been correctly identified. Is this like completely objective? Well, on paper, yes, but of course there are some gray areas even within intelligent tasks. And that's the case because let's take, for example, object detection. So there may be some objects in a picture that are fuzzy or that uh, are not like very clear. And so it's difficult to understand if you have like a person there or if you have like a statue perhaps because it's just like too far in the background or like the image is too grainy. So still, I would say that there are some levels of 
um, complexity to this success metric, but all in all, we can create this objective success metric for intelligent tasks. Let's move on to the second characteristic that I want to highlight about um, intelligent tasks, and that is that they are well-defined problems, so we can formally define them. It's not too difficult to think how we can formally define the speech recognition problem, so we can define the language and we can define the objective success metrics. So all in all, these tasks are simple enough so that we can um, try to formalize them or at least like reduce them to something formal that works like quite well. Let's compare these intelligent tasks against these other problems, music music composition and music performance or painting. Now, let's take a look at those two different characteristics and see how they fare within a creative task. So can we have an objective success metric for music or music composition? Well, I would argue that is an almost impossible or perhaps like philosophically impossible task because there isn't really a way of evaluating music in an objective manner. Let me give you an example here. So I'm a big fan of Beethoven, especially the late period of Beethoven. There's a body work called the late string quartets. When Beethoven published those quartets, initially the audience had a little bit of an issue to understand the quality, the magic in that music. And why is that the case? Well, because he was using some crazy harmonies with a lot of dissonances for the time and the overall treatment of tonality was like very, very fluid. People were not used to that kind of music. So it took this music some time before it got the recognition that it deserved. So all I want to say is that there's a level of variability in the success metric for a music composition. What's regarded as garbage today can be a masterpiece tomorrow, okay? So, no, in the case of creative task, we don't have an objective success metric. We can create some proxies, but still, it is not possible to have an objective metric. What about defining the problem in a formalized well, uh, way? So in other words, having a well-defined problem. So can we formalize music? No, we can't. It's too complex. There are so many factors and variables that work on so many different levels, all the way from uh, the physics of sound to music perception, music theory, musicology. So it is basically impossible to have a perfect formalization of the problem because it's too vast, it's too subjective, and it's too ambiguous. So here you have it, the difference between intelligent tasks and creative tasks. And as we'll see in a second, creative tasks are very, very difficult to reproduce with a machine because we don't have a success metric and they are ill-defined. Let's take a look at the fields that try to reproduce intelligent tasks and creative tasks with machines. We'll start with intelligent tasks. And of course, at this level, we have artificial intelligence. And here I'm talking about all types of artificial intelligence from good old-fashioned AI, like rule-based system and more, all the way to the most contemporary and advanced neural network architectures. So at this level, we deal with intelligent tasks. Now we can say that a branch of artificial intelligence is called computational creativity and the goal of this discipline is to try to build machines that can uh, undertake creative tasks, solve creative problems. So we have still another sub-discipline within the realm of artificial intelligence, and of course, computational creativity in this case, is just like a Russian doll, and that is generative music. Okay. But let me give you 
my definition of generative music. So there are a lot of definitions of generative music. This is the one that I came up with and I'm quite satisfied. Yeah, that's because I came up with it. Right, so generative music is the art and science of developing computer programs that create music with a varying degree of autonomy. Now, let me break down the most important part of this definition. So I say that generative music is an art and a science. Why is that the case? Well, the scientific part is quite straightforward. We're dealing with a lot of math, with uh, a lot of technology here. So yeah, of course, if you want to be active in generative music, you have to have like that scientific slash um, technological side to it. But it's also an art. And the reason it's an art because it's because it is ill-defined because we're trying to replicate what humans can do in a creative setting and music therefore as we saw earlier is ill-defined we don't have a, an objective success metric so people who work in this space tend to be creative crafters what do i mean by that well we try out a lot of ingredients, see what works, see what doesn't, and we use this approach that's very empirical. It's just like a glorified technological artisan who knows a lot about music as well. So you have that aspect of artisanship on the one hand, and that's more... I would say like rigid, well, not necessarily rigid, but more precise scientific technological approach on the other side. Then I want to draw your attention to the last part of this definition. So that is like we, we develop like these computer programs that create music, of course, but with a varying degree of autonomy. What do I mean by that? Well, as we'll see in a future video, we'll see that like, it is possible to have systems that do different things. In the, at the end of the day, of course, like, they create music, but you may have fully autonomous systems, a little bit like Music LM, like if you've heard like, the news lately, like L Music LM was all over the place, where you just write a prompt, you hit generate, and you get like a full piece of music, or at least like a small section of a piece of music, and the machine does like all the magic for you. So that is like one end of the spectrum, but on the other end of the spectrum, you have an approach where you can, where a musician, where a creative person can interact with the machine and negotiate the music to be generated together. So that is a way more interactive way of creating music. So as you can see, these generative music models not necessarily models, but systems. That's a little bit larger of a concept and I like it more. So these uh, systems can have, can demonstrate different degrees of autonomy when they create music. A quick interlude here. So if you want to discuss all of these topics with other people, I highly suggest you to join the Sound of AI Slack community, if you haven't done so yet. So there, we're gonna have a channel that's completely dedicated to the discussions about the Generative Music AI course, and it's called, not surprisingly, Generative Music AI course. I'll leave you the link in the description section below. Different people refer to generative music with different names. The one that I love the most is just the old plain generative music. I think it was introduced by Brian Eno a few decades back, but there are a lot of other names for this discipline. For example, algorithmic composition, music meta creation, procedural music, and music AI or creative music AI. Now, algorithmic composition. So in this case, I think this used to be quite trendy back in the day before machine learning and AI. It was more like algorithmic like processes and all of that. Music meta creation, I believe, was introduced by Philippe Pasquier and his research group. And the idea is really cool because 
we create a system that creates music. So we are at a meta level. So that's why we use meta creation for this field, which is super cool. Then we have procedural music and that is connected. I've heard that a lot in video games, video games music. So you have like some procedures, some mechanisms that you can use to generate sounds as well as uh, music. And indeed, there's also like another field that's adjacent to generative music that's called like procedural sound generation. And that's been extensively used in uh, video games. And finally, we have music AI. I really don't like this one that much because music AI is very, very broad because you have the whole other side of the moon that is music information retrieval. So the ability to extract information from music and analyze it. And that is also music AI, right? But I would, I would argue like, that that is a little bit more on the intelligent task kind of thing. Like for example, if you want to extract, um, I don't know, like um, tempo, there like you have a clear success, objective success metric there for identifying tempo there. Of course, like even there, there are, there's a lot of ambiguity because at the end of the day, with all of those tasks, like for example, uh, dividing a piece of music into its uh, phrases or its structures, different sections, there's a lot of ambiguity there as well. So it's not completely objective, but it's definitely more objective than the other side, this side of the moon that is the creative one, the generative one. So if anything, rather than using music AI, I would refer to generative music as creative music AI, but you get the idea. So you have a lot of names that have been used over time to define this discipline. So be aware of those. One thing that's super important to understand is that generative music is a discipline that's built on top of many different disciplines, as you can see here. And it draws upon all of them. This doesn't mean that you have to be an expert at all of those disciplines, but you have to know your way around. Let me analyze each one of this in isolation and uh, let you try to understand how it's relevant for generative music. We'll start from AI. Well, this is quite straightforward. All of the techniques that we use for generating music come one way or another from artificial intelligence. Initially, we used way more traditional AI techniques like rule-based systems or generative grammars, Markov chains, all of this kind of stuff. And then over time, we adopted a lot of the more advanced approaches like neural networks and deep learning. Digital signal processing or audio digital signal processing, it's extremely important in generative music, especially if you're dealing with a raw audio generation because you want to be able to manipulate uh, the uh, di directly like waveforms or spectrograms. So you need to know quite a bit about digital signal processing in order for doing that effectively. Then there's another one that's super dear to me. Now, within an academic environment, software engineering is not super important for generative music because you usually work on small scale systems, on prototypes, toy generative music systems. And it's not necessary to have an overall software engineering framework there. But the moment you cross the chasm and get into the industry, you'll realize like, that generative music systems are very, very complex machineries. And you need to have quite solid software engineering skills in order to organize this code bases that can be quite extensive, quite massive, in order for them to be reliable, robust, and flexible at the same time. Music cognition is also very important for generative music. I've used it extensively building generative music systems. Uh, let me give you an example. So when I was working at Melodrive, we were building this um, music AI engine that would generate music that would sort of change its emotional state on the fly. And now we had to use a lot of understanding and knowledge coming from music cognition in order to 
create the music that could elicit a particular emotional response in uh, the user who would actually use a melodrive. Of course, music theory is extremely important for generative music and you want to use it so that you can encapsulate as much knowledge as possible within your system. I've used it every time I've worked on a generative music system. For example, for, um, let's say, I'll give you this example. So take Refusion, for example. This is one of the latest generative music models out there. It uses uh, deep learning. Now, the problem with Refusion or all of these deep learning based models is that they tend to create short segments of music, right? What if you want to create a full song, a full composition? Well, you have to stitch together a lot of these musical phrases. Now, you need to have a good understanding of music theory to understand how to stitch them together. So this is, you can leverage this level of understanding about music in order to stitch together the music phrases that have been created, generated by a deep learning model. So as you can see, you can use music theory at every corner, really. Now, musicology is also extremely important and you definitely use it extensively, especially if you want to recreate a particular genre of style. So you want to capture all of those nuances which come from a particular style. So you, you have to have a musicological mind in order to analyze a genre and extract the things that are the most important and use them in your system. And that information can also be used to create a data set that where like some of these nuances are represented. So it is extremely important. And finally, we have MIR or music information retrieval. As I've already mentioned, this is sort of the flip side of generative music. And these two subfields or fields, however you want to call them, um, work together quite a lot because through music information retrieval, for example, we can extract a lot of information and data that then we can feed into generative music models. So as you'll see, all of these disciplines at a level or another contribute to generative music as a whole. Generative music has been around for quite some time, but we still have a lot of challenges. Let me give you three very important challenges that we haven't solved yet. The first one is music representation. How do we represent music and we use that representation for embedding our understanding of music in a generative music system so that it can leverage that representation for generating music. This is extremely complex and the reason is because it, we can't formalize music because it's too complex as we so already. Now, the point is, if you have a good representation of music, you're half the way to have an amazing generative music system. There are a lot of music representations that have been used over time. Some are symbolic, other are statistical based. We can use rules, we can use embeddings, we can use audio or spectrograms, but we don't have the perfect music representation. So this is a very open field of research. The second challenge is, unsurprisingly, about evaluation. How can we evaluate the output of generative music systems? And we've seen that we don't have an objective success metric. It doesn't make any sense in music. So we'll have to create methodologies that are specific for a certain task. They work well like for one task, but not necessarily for another task. And connected with this second challenge, we have the third challenge, and that is who should evaluate generative music systems? And that's definitely super important in an academic environment where we want to understand the quality of these systems, right? And the answer here is not clear. So should we have normal listeners without a musical background evaluate the output of these systems or should it be musicians? or musicologists, or musicians who have experience with the particular style that the generative music model attempts to recreate. So as you see, there are a lot of open challenges. Probably we'll never be able to solve all of these challenges. We can probably asymptotically 
get closer to the solution but will never really get there because this creative task like music composition is so fuzzy it's so subjective there's so much ambiguity that it is impossible to solve it to crack it completely and that for me is something super exciting because i know that no matter how much time i put into this effort and how much time and effort uh, the whole community puts into it there will always be an opportunity to do something more something better given the open-ended uh, nature of this process of this problem and that's super fascinating for me let's wrap up this video by mentioning the most important points that we've gone through in this lecture first creative tasks unlike intelligent tasks don't have an objective success metric and they are ill-defined Generative music is the art and science of de developing computer systems that create music with different degrees of autonomy. Then we've seen that generative music goes by many names, like algorithmic composition, music meta creation, or procedural music. Generative music is highly interdisciplinary, and in order to create these models, you have to know quite a lot about a bunch of different fields like artificial intelligence, music theory, or music information retrieval. Finally, we've seen that generative music has a lot of open challenges. Congrats, you've made it till the end of this first lecture. Before you go, you know what can help us a lot? If you leave a like and you share this video with your friends and colleagues. In any case, I'll see you tomorrow. And tomorrow we have a super interesting topic to cover that is the history of generative music. Until tomorrow, take care.